الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد my dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته the topic of today's lecture is diseases of the heart and their cures Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in surah al-shura A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Yawma la yanfa'u ma'lum wa la banun illa man ata Allah bi qalbin salim The day when neither wealth nor children will benefit except him who brings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu qalbun salim a heart which is pure a heart which is clean <coughs> my brothers and sisters let me ask you three questions and you don't have to answer me but you think about these questions and answer yourself First question, if I ask you as you sit here, what are your three top in order of priority? What are your three top concerns? What are the three things that you are most concerned about just now? Top of the mind. I don't want you to reflect too much, I don't want you to think too much because if it is top concern, then instantly it pops up in the mind. The moment you say top concern, what's my top concern? Will I have my job? What's my top concern? What happens to my family? Whatever it is, top three concerns. I want you to list them. Those of you who are carrying notebooks, Alhamdulillah, make a note on that. Next question with respect to the first question. How many of you put number one in those top three concerns? My Akhira. Alhamdulillah, I'm seeing some show of hands. Second question. If I ask you to list your top three strengths, what are your top three strengths? One, two, three. List them, top three strengths. Next question with regard to the second question. How many of you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the number one strength? Your strengths, Allah. MashaAllah, honest people, I don't see any show of hands. Maybe this thing is blinding me, Allah. How is it that Muslims do not put Allah as a strength, as your strength? Third question. If I ask you to list the top three people you love, and don't fool yourself because this is a leading question. Seriously ask yourself this question. Before I ask the question, what would it have, what would it have been? Top three people you love. List them. For how many of you did you put Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as number one? As I told you, it's a leading question. You are the one to decide whether you would really have put Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or whether you put it because now you are sitting in this masjid, in this lecture and so on, so you are smart. Whichever one, Allah alam, it's, it's your life. But ask yourself that question. For who, which one of you is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one you love the most? I'm not asking these as random questions. All these three questions are related to diseases of the heart. And all these three questions have dalail and proofs in the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the ahadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
Alhamdulillah, I am sitting in this beautiful masjid. And when I was coming here and when my lecture was announced in this masjid, there was one thing which everybody told me. And they said that this masjid is in the middle of the Beverly Hills of Kuala Lumpur. He said the houses around this masjid are all multiple million dollar houses. They are all high net worth individuals who live around this masjid. And Alhamdulillah, I see that this masjid is completely full. I am not being sarcastic. This masjid is full. If you cannot see some of the people who are sitting here, that's your problem. Because Rasulullah said in his hadith that when people gather for the zikr of Allah, there are teams of malaika who rove the earth and search the earth for people who are gathered for the zikr of Allah Jalla Jalalu. And when they find them, they surround them and they get close to them. And the word of the hadith is such that it means close as if in an embrace. And they fill the space. And then when the space finishes, they layer tear upon tear till they reach the first heaven. So this masjid alhamdulillah is filled. Even though some of the people who are in the masjid are visible to us and some of them and most of them are not visible to us alhamdulillah but they are there. And they are witness and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. Because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said that when this majlis is over, then these malaika go to Allah Jalla Jalalu and they report about this majlis. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need their report, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows before they can tell him. And they say, oh Allah, we came from such and such a place from Masjid Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu from in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. On that speck of grain of sand in this kainat of yours which is called the earth. And the malaika will say, we came from that small grain of sand called the earth. And on that grain of sand is a needle spot called Malaysia. And in that needle spot is a particle called Kuala Lumpur. And in that particle is this very small dot called Masjid Umar al Khattab. And we came from that place. And these people were gathered there only for the love of you. And they were gathered there to listen, listen about you and to remember you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows before they can tell him, Allah will ask them, what did they want? And they will say, Allah, they wanted your forgiveness and they wanted your Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows before they can tell him, will ask them, have they seen my Jannah? And they say, Ya Rab, no, they have not seen your Jannah. Then Allah will say, if they see the Jannah, then what would they want? And the malaika would say, Allah, if they saw your jannah, they would want it even more. And then Allah will say, well, what else did they want? And they would say, oh Allah, they wanted freedom from the fire. They wanted, they did not want to go to Jahannam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows before he is told, he asked them, have they seen my jahannam? They say, Allah, they have not seen your jahannam. Then Allah says, why then, if they saw the Jahannam, what would their state be? And the Malaika would say, Allah, they would beg for your forgiveness and they would beg for relief from the Jahannam, freedom from the fire, even more. And then my brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the Malaika, that you be a witness. That on the day of judgment, when they are presented before me, I will give them what they wanted and I will protect them from that which they wanted protection from. And these malaika who are sitting here with us, 
who are listening to me speaking and they are watching you listening and they are watching you making notes, they will be our witness on the day of judgment insha'Allah So as I was telling you, I was informed, they said that this masjid is in the middle of the housing of very wealthy people. He said, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, very nice. You should be in the middle of wealthy people. Never be in the middle of poor people. Please understand this. Never be in the middle of poor people. Always be in the middle of wealthy people. Surround yourself with people of wealth. But before you decide to surround yourself of, with people of wealth, decide what is wealth. What is wealth? Never be among poor people. But before you reject poor people, decide who is poor. Who is poor? It is strange. It is strange that you are wealthy people. You live in multi-million dollar mansions. And you name your masjid after a man whose izar, whose trousers had 12 patches on them. Ajib. What do you call it today if I, if I walk into this masjid and you find there are patches, my, my thumb is torn and I stitched here and stitched there, what will you say? It's strange. You are will, you are your wits. You live amongst all this wealth and you name your house, your, you name the masjid after a man who had 12 patches. The Sahaba, Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib and others, they went to his daughter, Hafsa radiallahu anha. And they took some cloths. And they gave it to Hafsa radiallahu anha and they said, give this to your father and tell him to make some new clothes. It does not look nice for the Khalifatul Muslimin, for the Amirul Mu'minin to be wearing clothes which are torn, which have patches. And then they said, but don't tell them our name. Don't tell him our name. They knew Umar ibn al-Khattab. So Hafsa radiallahu anha, Ummul Mu'mineen, our mother, the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab. When her father came to visit her, she said to her father, here is some clothes. And this has been presented by your brothers and they want you to make some new clothes because you wear torn clothes with patches on them. It doesn't look nice, they say it does not suit the Amirul Mu'mineen, does not suit the king, does not suit the Khalifatul Muslimin. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, who said this? Tell me the name. And Hafsa said, no. I will not tell you the name because they told me I should not tell you the name. I promise I cannot break my promise. So Umar ibn al-Khattab said, the only reason I do not do what I want to do is because you are the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he said to her, tell me, tell me, what was the dress of your husband like? And Hafsa Radiallahu she remained silent. And then Umar ibn al-Khattab Radiallahu the man who ruled over a kingdom much bigger than Malaysia. Umar ibn al-Khattab Radiallahu said, I wear these clothes because I am afraid that if I leave the way of my two companions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deny me their company on the Day of Judgment. And who are the two companions of Umar ibn al-Khattab? Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. 
He said, I am afraid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow me into the company of my two companions who have gone before me. My brothers and sisters, surround yourself with wealthy people, but decide what is wealth first. Islam came to change the definition of wealth. The first disease of the heart, the most lethal of cardiac illnesses, is the definition of wealth. Islam came to change the definition of HNI, High Net Worth Individual, from Abu Lahab to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Abu Lahab was a wealthy man. Abu Lahab was a high net worth individual. He was a multi-millionaire of his time. In today's time, he would have been a multi-billionaire. Islam changed that definition from Abu Lahab to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who was also a wealthy man. The issue is, what did he do with his wealth? The wealth of Abu Lahab went in decorating himself, enjoying himself, feeding his nafs, and the wealth of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went in freeing slaves, went in spending for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalu. So Allah gave him the honor of not only being the Khalil of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave him the honor of using that wealth, that pure wealth, to buy the land for, to build Masjid al-Nabawi, al-Sharif. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq bought the land on which Masjid al-Nabawi al-Sharif was built and I am talking about the original Masjid, which is now the, what we know as Riyadh al-Jannah. That land was bought by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not do things randomly. Allah picked the purest of the wealth and He gave that honor to that man so that people will pray on that land till Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to keep that masjid. So that Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made sujood the blessed forehead of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam touched the earth which Abu Bakr al-Siddiq bought for the sake of Allah. Surround yourself with wealthy people, but decide first what is wealth. I come from a place called Hyderabad, and we had a king, Mir Usman Ali Khan, the Nizam of Hyderabad. And my grandfather, Nawab Diyazan, was the head of security and police for his state. He was the Kotwal of Hyderabad. And our king, Mir Usman Ali Khan Bahadur, the Nizam of Hyderabad, the seventh Nizam, was the wealthiest individual that ever existed from Pharaoh Ramesses the fourth till today. Mir Usman Ali Khan had more wealth than the king of Saudi Arabia, than all the kings of Malaysia, than the king of Brunei and everywhere. He had more wealth than all of them. And this is not my, uh, in my imagination. There was a survey that was done and published. And they said as a single individual, that man had more wealth than anybody who ever lived from the time of the Pharaoh of Egypt. And his grandson, one generation, his grandson today lives in a two-bedroom apartment in Ankara in Turkey because his mother, his mother was one of the princesses of the Sultan of Turkey, of the, of the last Ottoman Sultan. She was the daughter of Princess Durra Shahwar. She was the daughter of the Sultan and therefore the government of Turkey gives a pension the grandson of the richest king who ever existed from the pharaoh till today lives in a two-bedroom apartment in Turkey in Ankara on the pension of his mother. There is no amount of wealth that can last forever. What is your wealth compared to the wealth of Usman al-Khan? 
It's not even a, a worth a cent. How long do you think that will last? My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hajj, He said, لا تعمل أبصار ولكن تعمل قلوب التي في الصدور Allah said, it is not the eyes which go blind. It is the hearts in the chest, in the breast, which go blind. And you know why those hearts go blind? They go blind because these glasses which we wear on our hearts. Those glasses get foggy, they get clouded. And as they get clouded, the more and more clouded they get, the more and more the heart is blinded. Al-Walid bin Marwan, the, Bani, the, the Khalifa of Bani Umayyah came to Mecca for Umrah and he asked if any of the Tabi'in were there, alive. And they took him to one of the Tabi'un, one of the Awliya Allah, insha'Allah. And he asked him a question, he said, why do we fear death? He said, why do I dislike death? He said, I don't want to die. Why do I fear death? And this alim, this wali of Allah, he said to him, that it is very natural. It is very natural that you love to live in the house that you have decorated. You love to live in the house that you have decorated. And you hate to go into a house which you have left desolate. Viran. Desolate. Many of us build houses. I'm sure many of you built your own houses. And you know and I know how much of time and energy and you know worry and, and mental pressure we spend over what kind of tiles we should have in the bathroom. I'm not even talking about you know your, your uh, and I see a lot of smiles on the faces of the sisters and a lot of grief on the face of the brothers because you know, you, they have to pay for what you desire. Huh? Tiles in the bottom, amount of energy and mental, should it be this one or that one and this color doesn't match and that color doesn't match and when I listen to this I say and, and all the time you are sitting there doing what? You are worrying about the, whether the tile matches or it doesn't match? My question is how much of time and energy do we spend over that house? to which every single one of us will go and live in permanently until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises us on the day of judgment. How many of us are worrying about what kind of lighting there is in that house? How many of us are worrying whether there is air conditioning in that house or not? People say Malaysia is a hot place. And Alhamdulillah, I, may Allah bless you, I love coming to this country and I was saying to somebody, the two countries where I always feel at home and I go as if I've gone to my own home is one is Malaysia, one is South Africa. The kind of welcome, you know, warm-hearted people, mashallah. It's not only Malaysia, the country is warm, the hearts of the people of Malaysia are warm. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep them warm, Alhamdulillah. So people tell me Malaysia is a hot country, I, I don't know because when I go to Malaysia, I never see the outside atmosphere. I am surrounded by wealthy people, so I am always living in, you know, air-conditioned homes or air-conditioned massages or air-conditioned offices and I can only see the outside, it looks nice, but whether it's hot or cold, doesn't matter, I am living in air-conditioned surroundings. But my question is, when I go into my khabar, none of you will come with me. None of you will come with me. 
what is the air conditioning there what am i doing about the air conditioning in my khabar what am i doing about the lighting in my khabar or am i going to am i content to go into a dark hole in the ground Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu, I'm giving you examples only of, of rich and wealthy sahaba. Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu, when he used to go to a cemetery, to a graveyard, he would weep so much, his beard would become wet with tears. And somebody asked him, why do you cry so much? I mean, when, when you hear about the accounts of Jahannam and so on, you don't cry so much, but when you come to this place, you you weep and weep and weep. Why do you cry so much? And he said, because I heard from my Habib Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the khabar, the grave is the first stage of the akhirah. For the one for whom that first stage is made easy, the rest of it is easy. But the one who gets caught in that first stage, his akhirah is destroyed. And he said, I weep because I know that one day I will go there. And Allah protects those who are faithful to him. Surround yourself with wealthy people. Uthman ibn Affan, one of the wealthiest of the Sahaba. <laughs> Rasulullah says, who will give funds for Tabuk? And Uthman ibn Affan comes and says, Oh, Ya Rasulullah, I give 1,000 camp, 1,000, I will outfit 1,000 soldiers. Meaning their mounts, their armor, their weapons, provisions, everything, 1,000 soldiers. Rasulullah said, and more. He said, Ya Rasulullah, another 1,000 soldiers. Nabi said, more. He said, another 1,000 soldiers. Nabi said, more. He went to his house, he came back with bags and he, and he opened the bags and he poured into the lap of Rasulullah gold dinars, gold coins, a heap of gold coins. And Nabi Sallallahu put his fingers through the gold coins and he ran them through his fingers like this and he said, after this, Osman can do no wrong. He said, after this, Allah will not hold him accountable for anything. And how did he die? At the age of almost 90, sitting there reading Quran. The ignorant people have rebelled. Ignorant people have rebelled. They surrounded his house. They do not let him come out. They stopped his water, they stopped his food. Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib who came and he said to Usman ibn Affan, he said, I have brought my two sons, Hassan and Hussain, they will stand here and they will die before anyone touches you. First he came and said, give me the, give me the permission, because you are the Khalifa, I cannot act without your permission. He said, give me the permission, I will destroy them. I said, I have, I have, I have, I have the power. I have an army. He said, I will finish them. Usman ibn Affan said, no. He said, I will not allow any blood to be spilt on my account. I'm saying this to you because one of the diseases of the heart today is the differences between the Muslims. We cannot, we don't like somebody because of how he, whether he makes Rafael then or he does not make Rafael then. On all kinds of furui matters, we divide the Ummah. See the behavior of the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thanks to whom there was an Ummah. To rebel against the Khalifa of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is irtidal. It takes you out of Islam. To threaten the Khalifa, to want to kill the Khalifa is irtidal. It takes you out of Islam. Uthman ibn Affan could have given the fatwa to say these are all murtaddin. These people have exited Islam. Go and kill them, chase them away. Did he give that fatwa? 
He said to Ali bin Abi Talib, no. He said, do not draw your sword. I will not allow any blood of a Muslim to be spilled on my account. Then Ali bin Abi Talib said, I will leave my two sons here, the grandsons of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sons of Fatima to Zahra radiallahu anha. He said, I will leave them here. They will protect you and they only after they are killed will anyone be able to come to you. He said, no, take them back. I will not allow any harm to happen to the family of Rasulullah on my account. And he is sitting there. And they told him, just give up your khilaf. He said, Rasulullah told me that Allah will give you a mishlah, will give you a cloak. And people will want to take it out. And he said, do not take it out. Do not take it off. And he was fasting that day. He was fasting, he was reading Quran. And he said to them, he said, today I saw Rasulullah in my dream. And Nabi Sallallahu said, Uthman, today you will make iftar with me. So he said, I'm waiting to go to make iftar with Rasulullah Sallallahu Surround yourself with wealthy people. And when they killed him, his blood stained the page of the Mus'haf which he was reading. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused that Mus'haf to be preserved till today. My brothers and sisters, we are sitting in the house of Allah. I ask myself that we are in the middle of this locality of wealthy people. May Allah protect your wealth and preserve your wealth and enable you to benefit from this wealth and not make this wealth a source of questioning for you on the Day of Judgment. You had an invitation this morning to come to the house of the king. I am asking you this question. Supposing this morning you had an invitation. Supposing there was a talk to say the king is going to invite people today, this morning to come and have breakfast with him. How many of you would be waiting to say, will the king invite me? Will I get an invitation? And if you did not get an invitation, how many of you would say, Why did I not get an invitation? Why did I not get an invitation? Is the king not pleased with me? Did I do something wrong? And how many of you will say, Will go and chase and say, No, no, find me an invitation. I, have, I want an invitation. How can I get an invitation? Do I need to ask somebody? Do I need to pay some money for it? Do I need, what do I need to do? I need to be invited. How can all the others go to the house of the king and I am the only one sitting in my house? What will the people say? He is the only one who wasn't invited. Do you think you will do this or you won't do this? Am I exaggerating? And this morning, from the house of the king, an invitation was sent. Hayya ala sala, hayya ala fala. How many of us came to the house of this king? تعالى الله الملك الحق لا إله إلا هو رب العرش الكريم 
who is the king who is bigger than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jalla Jalalu. And when he invites, how many of us answer that invitation? How many of us are concerned? And how come I did not hear this invitation? Because we do not hear with these ears, we hear with the heart. People go to the house of the king, they go to the masjid of Allah, not because they hear the adhan, but because what the adhan does to them in their heart. Everybody hears the adhan. The people who are Muslim and the people who are not Muslim also they hear the adhan. But who goes to the masjid? The one who goes to the masjid is the one to whom the adhan does something. The question I ask myself is, did the adhan do anything to me this morning? And if the adhan did not do something to me in the morning, then there is a sign of disease in my heart. And what is the dalil of this? The dalil of this is the kalam of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Anfal, He described the qualities of the mu'mineen. He described the qualities of the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَضَقُنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقًّا لَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the qualities of the believers and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said verily the mu'mineen are those whose hearts shiver with the fear and the grace and the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned before them Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned before us? Do we know when it says Hayya ala salah? Do we know who the invitation is coming from? Is the name of the inviter being announced before that or not? Please listen and listen carefully my brothers and sisters. Before the invitation in the adhan, two other things happen. Before the invitation in the Adhan, the name of the one who is inviting is announced. And then, the relationship of the guest with the host is announced. Your relationship, my relationship, with the inviter is announced and only then is the invitation given. Have you ever, have you ever heard the Adhan and listened to the Adhan with this understanding? Think about this. We hear the Adhan every day. What is the Adhan? Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar He is the one who is inviting Allahu Akbar 
and then our relationship with him ashhadu an la ilaha illallah there is no one worthy of worship except allah is this our relationship with allah or not no one worthy of worship except allah a relationship is declared ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and who taught us this how to worship ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah then the invitation is given to you who just accepted ashhadu an la ilaha illallah there is no one worthy of worship except allah and then the invitation is given hayya ala salat you just said that there is no one worthy of worship except allah so come to the worship of allah show that you are speaking the truth this relationship was announced on your behalf ashhadu an la ilaha illallah now prove that this statement was right hayya ala salat writer and then the signature on the invitation who is the invitation from allahu akbar allahu akbar la because they hear the adhan they come because of what the adhan does to their heart wajilat qulubuhum wa idha tuliyat alayhim ayatuhu zadatuhum imana when the ayat of allah are recited before them their iman increases When they see the ayat and signs of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala around them then iman increases Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us diagnostic tools to decide whether there is disease in my heart or not and that is why I am presenting this ayat before you because that is the topic of my lecture diseases of the heart So let me give you the tools to see whether our hearts are diseased or whether they are healthy First tool does anything happen to my heart when i hear the name of allah second tool what happens to my heart and my iman 
when I hear the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being recited and when I see the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around me, does anything happen to my heart or not? What should happen? My iman should increase. I must say, subhanallah, this is my Rabb. This is the one I worship. My iman increases. So let us do the test. Let me recite for you the introduction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in his kalam, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum La ta'khudu sinatu wa la naum Lahu ma fi al-samawati wa ma fi al-ard Man dha al-ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi-idhni Ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim وما خلفهم ولا يعيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يهوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم الله أكبر الله لا إله إلا الله والله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المحيمن العزيز الجبا مؤمن المحيمن العزيز الجبا المتكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق الباري المسمر له الأسماء الحسنى يصبه له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله والله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله وعد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد Diagnostic scan over What is the report? Only you can tell Only I can tell What is the report? of the condition of my heart. Diagnostic test is over. Scan is over. وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the consequence of this. Those whose heart shivers, whose heart shiver with the grace and majesty and awe and magnificence of Allah, and whose Iman is raised, 
when they read the Quran, when they listen to the Quran, whose iman is raised and strengthened when they see the ayat of Allah around them, what happens to them? They have tawakkul on Allah. Tawakkul only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody and nobody else. My brothers and sisters, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the sickness of the heart. And he mentioned this in a hadith in Sunan Abu Dawud. The hadith is in Sunan Abu Dawud, narrated by Thawban radiallahu. He said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the people of the world will soon summon one another, they will call one another to attack you as people invite each other when they are eating to share in their food. Someone asked, will that be because we will be small in number? Rasulullah said, no, you will be numerous. You will be numerous at that time, but you will be like the scum and rubbish that is carried down on the surface of the torrent. You will be like the scum and rubbish, the foam on the flood waters. And Allah will take away the izzah. He will take away the izzah and the fear and the khawf of you that is in the hearts of people today. Allah will take away your izzah from the hearts of people. And he will put wahan in your hearts. He will put wahan in your hearts. And somebody asked, Ya Rasulullah, what is wahan? And Nabi Sallallahu said, Hubbul dunya wa karahiyatul maut. He said, love for the dunya and dislike of death. Dislike to leave the dunya. Everybody dislikes death itself because we fear the pain of the death. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all your deaths very, very easy, inshallah. Full of khair, inshallah. Like Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, when the believer dies, it's like a drop of water which falls from the jug. May Allah make your death like that. Because one day it is going to come. There's no escape from it. So when it comes, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it such that it is very easy and simple. But the dislike is the dislike to leave this dunya because we love this dunya. Hubbud dunya and related to hubbud dunya, karahiyatul maut. Dislike for death. My dear brothers and sisters, both of these illnesses are related only to one thing and that thing is lack of yaqeen in the akhirah. Believe me, say whatever you want. If we love this dunya, if the dunya is in our heart, there's only one reason for it. And that reason is that we think that we will stay here forever. No matter how illogical that might seem, no matter how illogical that might seem, that is the reason. This is the reason the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us. Why do people fear death? Because of this. Because they love the dunya. And that love of the dunya is called ghafla, forgetfulness. We forget where we are, we forget who we are. We forget that we have to leave this world no matter how much we have. And we forget that the more you have, the more difficult it will be to leave that. The one who has nothing, the one who has a little, for him to leave it is easy. But the one who spent his whole life accumulating and accumulating, especially if he spent his life accumulating without worrying about the means. I must have money. 
no matter how it comes what what happens to that person when the time comes to die remember that life will stick in every brick in your palace before your soul comes out it will stick in every hole in every tile in every coin and it will not be easy it will not be easy ghafla forgetfulness and that's why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said ala bi dhikrillah tatma innul qulub itminan at qalb the fear the, the, the feeling of safety the feeling of comfort the lack of fear of the qalb is in what not in money not in wealth wealth adds to the fear the more you have the more you fear losing it wealth adds to the fear wealth doesn't take away fear this is one of the figments of the imagination one of the deceptions of the world i just completed a series of uh, many of you get the fajr reminder every day which we send out from our masjid and i just completed a series of fajr reminders on deceptions of the world listen to that the deception of the world is if i surround myself with material stuff i am safe but the reality is the more you have the more you fear losing it the more you fear losing it the less you have the less fear hasan al basri rahmatullah alayhi is standing in salah in tahajjud and while he is praying he hears a, a noise as if somebody has as if a burglar has entered his house so hasan al basri rahmatullah alayhi he completes his salah when he finishes his salah there is a man standing there and his burglar was also a muslim and he was a funny man you know he, he stood there he asked hasan basri he said what kind of a man are you there is nothing in your house so hasan basri said who are you he said i am a thief i came to steal and there is nothing in your house he said how do you live like this and the thief is giving him advice He is giving advice to Hasan al Basri, Rahmatullah. He said, "How do you live like this? You have nothing in the house." So Hasan al Basri said, "No, no, no. I have something." He said, "What?" He said, "No, I have. I'll give you. You came to take from my house. You will not go empty-handed." He said, "I will give you." He said, "Where is it?" He said, "Go make wudu and come." He said, "Make wudu and come." So the thief said, "Okay, well, you know, I have got nothing to lose. This man says he will give me something." so make budu and come maybe he's going to give me gold you know don't touch gold without budu ha huh? how many of you make budu before you touch gold so hasan al basri the man makes budu and come and hasan al basri says come stand here next to me and in tahajjud is allah akbar and then hasan al basri recites quran and he is praying and the man is standing next to him and he is praying in the imamat of hasan al basri rahmatullah alayhi huh? you can only give what you have you can only give what you have you can go to the king today now the palace is nearby you can go to the king and you can meet the king and you can tell the king you can say to him i have a very bad headache i have a terrible migraine please give me medicine what will the king do the king will say here is some money go to the doctor no 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 not i have kept you you prescribe medicine for me what will the king say the king will say i have no medicine i do i am not a doctor i don't know what medicine i don't know why your head is aching i can't help you he say what you are a king you can't help me i am a king but i am not a doctor i can only give what i have I can only give what I have. I have money I can give you money. But I don't have what you want. 
Hassan al-Basri said, I can only give what I have. And what does Hassan al-Basri have? Hassan al-Basri has Allah. The man came for money, the man came to steal material. Hassan al-Basri said, I don't have that, I can't give you. I can only give you what I have. What do I have? I have my Allah. I have my Rabb. So stand here next to me. When the Salah is finished, the thief is weeping, he makes tawbah and he says, Jazakumullah khair. You gave me a wealth which I could never have stolen. And you gave it to me without stealing. He said, I make tawbah from this life of mine. I will not steal anymore. What is the state of us? Ghafla. And the second cause is persistence in sin. Continuing to sin. We know something is wrong, we still do it. The ulama have said that there are two reasons for persistence in sin. One is that you believe that Allah is not seeing you sinning. If you actually believe Allah is not seeing you, this is halas, end of Islam. And the second one is that you don't, you don't believe that Allah is not seeing, but you don't care. There is no shame to commit a sin even though I believe that Allah is watching. Now what kind of iman is that? What kind of iman is that? My brothers and sisters, what is the cure for this? Two things. One, one, number one, sincere tawbah. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this wealth of tawbah. What would we do if Allah had not given us this wealth of tawbah? But Allah gave us this. He left the door open until we see the malaika, until we see malakul mouth, the door of tawbah is open. So what should we do? We make sincere tawbah. Let us do it right now. Let not this talk be a witness against you and me. Let Allah not make me a witness against myself to say that you sent this to the people but you did not make tawbah. Let Allah not make me a witness against you to say that you heard him say this but you did not make tawbah. So let us make tawbah right now as we sit here. I make tawbah and you are my witness and you make tawbah and we are all each other's witnesses that we make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? That we will not commit sin insha'Allah al-musta'an knowingly. What happens unknowingly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him for his forgiveness but knowingly we will not disobey Allah. Make this niyyah from today. Make tawbah. Ensure that you earn halal. Leave haram sources of wealth. Ensure that you speak only which is good. Leave riba and slandering. You might say, well now what do I do at my kitty party? Think of something else to do. Or forget kitty party is even better than that. Whoever invented that word kitty party, I'm amazed that the, the ladies who are so, uh, mashallah, you know, feminist, you can't think of a better word than that. What's a kitty party? Hmm? You don't have kitty parties in Malaysia. Alhamdulillah, stay like that. Don't ask me what is it, I won't tell you. Yeah, it's there in, in India and everywhere. Uh, kitty parties. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the Malaysian sisters. And may Allah increase you in your ignorance about such things, inshallah. We make tawbah. And the second thing which cleans the heart is dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my brothers and sisters, dhikr is not only walking around with uh, beads or sitting in a halaqa and so on. Alhamdulillah, do make dhikr in a halaqa, nothing wrong with that. I'm saying don't restrict it to that. Dhikr is constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that we say, in everything that we do and in all the ahwal of our lives. 
في كل أعمال وفي كل أقوال وفي كل أحوال البارزة والخفي لسرق الأقوال أو في ما ما نبوي رحمة الله عليه the great شافعي عليه he said al idhar al niya being conscious of the niya في كل أعمال وفي كل في كل أقوال وفي كل أعمال وفي كل أحوال البارزة والخفي being aware and having his heart of the niya in everything that we say in everything that we do and in all the situations that we find ourselves in our lives whether this is hidden or whether it is visible so to have the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all aspects of our lives I want to end with dua by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill your hearts with His noor, to fill your lives with His dhikr, make the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most common word that is used in your language, in your conversation, at home, in your workplace, everywhere. Let this become part of your normal conversation. What does Allah think about this? What, will, will this thing please Allah or not? What will I answer to Allah about this? Make the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most common word that you use. What was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's way of doing this? What would Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what would he have done if he was here? Let your children talk about this. Let your children talk about this. I still remember I was in, uh, in New York. We were, we were in a Jamaat in New York. And uh, one of our brothers was taking us from one masjid to another masjid. And in the car was his little four-year-old son. So while we were driving this uh, little boy, he tells his father, he said, uh, Daddy, I asked Allah 40 times. So I asked the father, I said, what did he ask Allah 40 times? So his father told me a wonderful thing, which is something about upbringing of children. He said to him that, you know, we have taught him, my wife and I, we have taught him, that anything you want, ask Allah. Anything you want, ask Allah. So he said, he comes to the mother, he says, I want some chocolate, she says, ask Allah. And he says, from the beginning, you know, right from the beginning, so he has a little musalla, he goes and puts his musalla, he makes wudu, he goes and puts his musalla, he makes two rakat of salah, and he says, Ya Allah, tell my mom to give me chocolate. Then he comes and says, Mom, I asked ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in my heart, here is your chocolate. Everything we taught him, ask Allah, ask Allah, ask Allah. So the father says, Today, he knew that I am going to take you to that masjid. And his friend lives on the way to the masjid, so he wants to go and visit his friend. So he told me, Daddy, can I come with you? Will you drop me to my friend's place? So I said to him, you ask Allah. You can get into the car. You ask Allah. If Allah puts in my heart, I will drop you off. If he does not put in my heart, you come with me, we go home. So he got into the car and now he is telling me he asked Allah 40 times whether he can go to his friend's house. So he said, we will just take a detour and drop him to the friend and if he asks Allah 40 times, well, I better not say no, huh? Make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most beloved name, the most beloved word. Make it common amongst your children. Let not the name of Allah be a stranger in your homes. Let not the name of Muhammad Rasulullah be a stranger in your homes. So I make dua, may Allah fill your life with His dua, may Allah fill your life with His barakah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable you to become the standard bearers of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable you to be people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with in this dunya wal akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you the champions of Islam in this dunya and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise you as champions of, dunya, of, of Islam on the day of judgment in the akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you children who are kudratul ayn, who are the coolness of your eyes. 
Mashallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given some people who are the coolness of their own eyes and has given people who, are, who have children who are also the coolness of my eyes. But that particular coolness is sitting outside there and hiding. Bring him inside here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you children who will be a source of rahmah, a source of sadaqatul jariyah for you when you are gone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you children who are a source of honor for you in the dunya wal akhirah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give all that I have asked. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give everything that you ask with khair. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you whatever you and I have not asked from Him. Let Him give it. They give this to you as His gift to you, inshaAllah. Then they are not hearing the guy. Uh, the the uh, Hadi asked this question the diagnosis of the heart. He said that when you hear the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something happens in your heart. Uh, but he said there are some people. Uh, where, who, when they ask, a, when, they, when they hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, name, something happens in the heart, but they still commit sin. What do you say about such people? I say, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Obviously, it means that nothing is really happening. Because how can something be happening and you still do nothing? I got How can something be happening and you still do nothing? So you have to question yourself and say, really is something happening or not, right? Um, is network marketing halal? You have to ask the mufti, I am not a mufti, ask the mufti. How to ensure your daily decision and major decision gets the rida of Allah? MashaAllah, very good question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the, the criterion. And what is the criterion? لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ يُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the best example for you is the example of the life of my Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So therefore, if I want to know my decision and uh, if I want to know whether my action is right or not, what must I do? Compare it with the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If, if our decision, if our action is like the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Alhamdulillah, it has the rida of Allah. If it is different from the sunnah, then there is a doubt. If it is against the sunnah, then definitely it is wrong. Third question. I want to repent and, uh, and be sure that I get to focus 100% on repenting, but I often lose focus. Kindly advise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, from the shaitan, first ta'id billahi min shaitan rajim This is from shaitan. So, make say, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Ask the protection of Allah from shaitan. And make tawbah and continue to make tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the door of tawbah. Who can stop you? So, make, ask Allah's protection from shaitan. And make tawbah, inshallah. Allah will accept. How to keep being positive in life. And always remember that test in life has a hikmah behind it. You are answering your own question. The test in life has a hikmah behind it. So therefore, what do you do? You are positive. Tell me, what is the, what is the alternative we have? Sometimes people say, how can I be positive? So my question is, okay, so be negative. No problem. If you think that being negative is going to solve your problem, then be negative. The idea is to solve the problem, right? If you've got a problem, you want to solve it. So if you say, no, how can I be positive? No problem, be negative. Will the problem go away? It won't go away. The problem will actually become bigger. So frankly, there is no choice but to be positive. There's no point in being negative because being negative does not solve anything. Being positive has a chance. You might say, well, does being positive solve everything? No. Being positive does not solve everything, but it solves most things. Being negative solves nothing. So now you got a choice of these two things. What do you do? And then, uh, what, what is your advice to a wife whose husband is not praying? She advised him, but he doesn't listen. 
keep advising in the nice way you keep praying keep making dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the end of your responsibility if he still does not pray that is his problem he will face with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right don't make fatwa on him don't say you are a kafir you accept you accept islam because you will create problem for yourself so don't make fatwa just tell him advise him and say alhamdulillah this is what allah should do you keep praying recite quran talk about the greatness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to him take him to meet somebody who can put some sense into his head alhamdulillah you can do all of that make dua and inshallah that is that will be enough we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put power in your dua so that your husband starts praying from this salatu zuhur in a few uh, uh, not minutes but couple of hours from now inshallah Salam how do i get my son to be a hafiz he is nine by making him memorize the quran is there some other way <laughs> a good way to make your son a hafiz is to start memorizing the quran yourself this is the problem with parents i want my son to be this 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 what about you what about you forget your son you become half his first your family automatically become half his your son today has no role model who is the half is somebody outside mother is the, is the mother half is no father half is no who is the half is so and so who cares so and so you start memorizing the quran yourself you will become an inspiration for your son inshallah don't force children they make no sense if you force them you beat them this is one of the biggest musibah in our ummah almost every hip school that i have seen the teacher has a very high tech tool that they use to make of us what is that high tech tool a stick beat the quran into them huh? hammer the quran into them take one aya put it on his head and hammer bang 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 both the same one more aya bang 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 la haula wala quwwata illa billah and then we start on the member and we say nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not even frown at children and then we get off the member and we hammer the child maybe we do it while smiling huh? i'm getting so much pleasure out of hammering the kid la haula wala quwwata illa billah we make the children hate the quran instead of loving the quran don't force children you recite you memorize you make the quran a part of your life sit with the quran every day have a session in your house after some salah and maybe maghrib maybe isha sit with the children talk to them about the greatness of allah do talim of hadith do talim of tafsir and quran in the house they will love the quran they will come to you and say daddy mummy i want to become a hafiz then take them to the school then how to differentiate between temptation and reward take into consideration that we are to count our blessings and be grateful with what we already possess so that when something that seems to be too good to be true presents in front of us how do we differentiate it as either temptation usually the word temptation means something that leads to the anger of allah temptation is something that leads to the anger of or something which is haram something which is taking us away from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some kind of it may not be something which is completely haram it might be something which leads to haram this is also wrong it might be something which diverts our attention takes us away for example you're watching this football match now football match is not playing football is not haram watching it is not haram but you might be sitting in this at this time of this game and we are right at this moment when this goal is going to be scored and the azan goes off now what do you do what do you do you say now wait wait much is still there let, let's finish this goal huh? that is the problem that is a temptation because it is taking you away from the masjid now imagine Remember this thing imagine if you die at that moment you had a chance of dying in the masjid instead you chose to die in front of the tv screen that is the choice that is the choice somebody sent me this story wallah alam i hope it is true but uh, it's a beautiful story anyway They sent me the story. They said that there was a husband and wife, and the husband would phone the wife from the workplace as he was leaving, and he would say, "Please cook this for me," and she would cook. 
and his wife had a she had her own practice that any time she heard the adhan go off in the masjid immediately she would go for salah she wouldn't go to the masjid she's praying in the house but immediately she would pray as soon as they hear the adhan immediately she would start her salah this was her practice she used to do that so this husband used to phone so one day the husband phoned and he said uh, i'm coming and he asked her to make you know the uh, palestinians and syrians and lebanese they make this thing with grape leaves you know they 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 put filling in the grape leaves and they wrap it and they steam it and so on so he said i want to eat that please make that for me now that is a time consuming thing it's not easy it's not you know like instant coffee so she started making this and as she started making it she kept putting them and there were about four or five left azan went so now she thought to herself well my husband is on his way home is just three or four left maybe i can just finish these three put them in the pot and then i can go and pray then she thought to herself it is my practice any time allah subhanahu wa taala calls i go i have never delayed in that why should i delay today i finish my salah then i come come back to this bit so she left those three four like that and she went off to pray she made wudu and she started praying she started her salah husband came home <coughs> he called his wife there is no sound he opened the door of the house he came inside no sign of the wife he went into the kitchen and he sees all these things made there and three or four left and he said oh, what would have happened if you had he said to himself he's talking to himself he said what would have happened if you had finished this and then he went to look for her where is she where is she she is in sujood she has passed away she has died in such that she died so he suddenly saw her she is dead in sujood and the question in his mind is what is the question he asked himself what would have happened if you had finished this what would have happened she would have died in the kitchen instead of dying in sujood that is the question the question is that so how do you differentiate this temptation from reward if it is taking you to ghafla if it is taking you somewhere away from allah subhanahu wa taala it is temptation i we do not do that reward alhamdulillah if allah gives me wealth in a halal way if allah gives me wealth without me sacrificing the rights of allah without me sacrificing the rights of the people no no malfunctioning of hukuk allah no malfunctioning of hukuk al ibad if allah subhanahu wa taala gives me wealth in spite of all that and then this wealth i spend in the path of allah subhanahu wa taala remember what did i say the difference in wealth between abu lahab and abu bakar radhiyallahu anhu is it the amount you have or what you do with the amount which one what you do with the amount abu lahab what did he do with the amount he spent it on himself purely did he is abu lahab known for charity and remember we are not talking about muslim non muslim hatim at tai was not a muslim but hatim at tai is known for charity is abu lahab known for charity no abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu anhu what did he do with the wealth he spent it to free slaves so if it is if it is wealth alhamdulillah allah has given you mashallah alhamdulillah what am i spending it in remember how to how to differentiate between temptation and reward think of the questions of the of the day of hashar think of the questions of the day of hashar what are the questions allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask what did you do with the life that i gave you the time that i gave you what did you do with that allah will not say how long did you live allah will ask how did you live second question what did you do with your youth allah has given me youth allah has given, made me strong what do i do with that youth do i spend that strength and that health in the obedience of allah or do i spend it in disobeying allah third question what did you do with the wealth that i gave you where did you earn it from and where did you spend it so let us remember this question inshallah and that will help us to differentiate between temptation and reward There's somebody who is asking a question about how much of anger for the ex husband who is not executing his duties towards my children uh but the current wife controls everything 
Well, I mean, you know, these are these are some of the uh, these are some of the issues of life. I always say, you know, think of it positively. What is the positive? The positive is that this husband of yours who is not fulfilling his rights towards his children and towards you is actually building for you palaces in Jannah. So thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is giving his wealth to you in the Jannah on the, on the day of judgment. So thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Send him a thank you note, thank you for the palace in Jannah because this month's payment you didn't send. Send him a thank you note, thank you for giving me your good deeds on the day of judgment. I look forward to receiving them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope you are doing more good deeds because they will all come to me. Here is my thank you note for that. I should thank you for this, inshallah. Send him. Drive him crazy by smiling. People must remember, Allah has rights on us and people have rights on us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive us even if we do not fulfill his rights. I am not saying we should not, we have to fulfill, but Allah is Allah. Allah is Ghafur Rahim. But your wife is not Ghafur Rahim. Your husband is not Ghafur Rahim. Your father and mother's children are not Ghafur Rahim. Those people whose rights you are not fulfilling in the world, they are not Ghafur Rahim. They will not forgive you, believe me, on the day of judgment. They will extract. They will extract every penny. And they will extract them from your good deeds. There is no way of paying them back on that day. So be very careful before you uh, deny people their rights. Uh, health insurance, does it mean I am not placing my faith in Allah? Well, whether you are placing your faith in Allah or not, you should know. Right? Uh, as far as health insurance, is it jayas, not jayas? Ask the muftiyin. Uh, how can a new Muslim do when he always commits the same sin? Like not able for salah and a new Muslim not able to wear the hijab. They know it's sinful. Now there's a difference between not able and not doing. Not able and not willing. If you are not able, there is no sin on you. If you are not able, there is no sin on you. I can't do salah. Whatever is Allah, Allah, how somebody is not able. But if you are not able to do salah, because salah can be done sitting, can be done standing, can be done lying down, can be done only with isharat, can be done in a car, can be done anywhere. So, I mean, if you say, I can't do salah, what is the nature of that? Wallah ala. But if you can't do and it is a, it is an ability issue, then there is no, there is no sin, Allah will forgive inshallah. But if you are not willing to do, if you want to, then you have to look out for that. Same thing for hijab. I can't do hijab. Why? Because my head is made of grease. So every time I put the, the, the cloth, it slides off. What can I do? I've got a head of glass. Nothing stays on it. Nail it down. Huh? What do you mean can't do it? What's, what's can't about it? You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Well, no, no, maybe some sisters live in such difficult circumstances that if they wear a hijab, somebody will physically assault them or something. In that case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah forgive you and make it easy for you, inshallah. But please understand, don't put all these burdens on yourself, by yourself. Wear the hijab and make dua to Allah. Oh Allah, I put this on for you. Oh Allah, this is by your quwwat and your khudrat, by your power that I put this on. Ya Allah, the one who wants to take it off, let him face your power. Make this dua. Let him face the, your power if he wants to take off my hijab. I put this on in your name. I make you witness that I put this hijab on to please you. The one who wants to take it off, let him face you. Let me see who takes it off. Allah will paralyze his hand. Allah will paralyze his tongue. Allah will take away his life. If he touches you even. Why are you so weak? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remembering who you are asking. You are asking the Fatir of Sabawati Walad. Khalik of Sabawati Walad. Razik of Sabawati Walad. مالك السماوات والأرض مالك الأرش الكريم رب الأرش الكريم 
Malik ul Haq. That is the one you are asking. Why are you afraid? Don't worry about your abilities. Don't worry about your power. Ask him in his name. Ask him with his power. He will give. If he can make a pregnant camel come out of a mountain for the dua of Sani alayhi salam, he cannot make you keep hijab on your head even if the whole world turns against you. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Strengthen your iman. You don't worship a tree, you don't worship a stone. You worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jalla jalalu. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it is his right to be asked. Oh Allah, I give me because I am asking you. Give me because only you can give. Give me because I ask you and I don't ask anybody else. I have asked you and I will not ask anybody else. You are witness, I will not ask anybody else. You want to give me through somebody that is your choice. I am not asking you to give me through anybody. I am asking you. You give me directly. I asked you directly. You told me to ask you directly. You said, Udhudi. You said, ask me. You did not say, ask me through this one or that one. You said, Udhudi, ask me. I asked you. Now give me because I asked you. Give me because I asked you in the way you told me to ask you. Edit out this horrible sound, huh? La halwa la khubata illa billah. Build a connection with Allah, Wallah. Build a connection with Allah. Subhanallah. I mean, how poor can you get? How poor can you get? The one who does not worship Allah does not worship Allah. The one who does not know Allah does not know Allah. What about the ones who worship Allah but they don't know Allah? What about the ones who stand in Salah and they don't know Allah? They don't even know who they are asking. What about the ones who make dua and they don't even know who they are asking? How poor can you get? You cannot make salah. That is like saying, I have cancer but I cannot take the medicine. Then die. What is the answer to that? You cannot take the medicine Why your lips are stable. What do you mean you can't take the medicine? Salah is a tool, Salah is the weapon, Salah is the resource, Salah is the power, Salah is the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't make Salah. What do you mean you can't make Salah? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He will open the doors. This is another very important question. I know a brother, he is my close friend, but he likes to argue and debate in a harsh and rude way, especially when it comes to the topic of practicing Islam according to the Sunnah. The problem is the way he argued with me. I am very upset with him and try to avoid talking with him as I don't like debating with him. I feel guilty because of my anger towards him and I don't have patience with him. Please give advice. The best advice is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave. وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Say As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu my brother. That's the best advice for us. Don't argue with people. There's no sense in arguing with people. There's no sense in responding to rudeness. 
it gives importance to that rudeness if a donkey is braying do you bray back at the donkey if a dog is barking do you bark back at the dog no don't give importance to rude behavior don't acknowledge that rude behavior if somebody is behaving in a rude way even if they are talking about the quran and sunnah please understand people have this misconception just because i am i am telling you to do something about the quran and sunnah i have a right to say it rudely no you don't have a right to say it rudely nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam never said it rudely a man came into the masjid and he was praying two rakat tahiyatul masjid nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting there with the sahaba the man prayed two rakat salat and he came and he said assalamu alaikum ya rasulullah nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said wa alaikum assalam go and pray again you have not prayed the man went back he prayed he came back he said assalamu alaikum he said wa alaikum assalam he said go back and pray you have not prayed the man went again he came back again nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said wa alaikum assalam go back and pray you have not prayed the man said ya rasul i only know this i i i don't know how else to pray so nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam stood up and he showed him how to pray hasan and husain radhiyallahu anhum they came and they saw an old man an elderly man he was making wudu and the man was making wudu incorrectly wrongly now wrong wudu means there is no salah so what did they do these are the grandsons of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i'm not talking they were not small children at that time they were grown up what did they do did they say what kind of a stupid man you are you are an old man you don't even know how to make wudu did they say that no no hasan radhi allahu anhu said to the man he said uh, to him he said ya habbi ya ma yakul ma ya shaykh he said i want to make wudu please correct me i just want to make sure that i make the wudu properly please look at me please correct me and he started making wudu he made he completed his whole wudu and the man said may allah bless you i got the message <coughs> he didn't tell the man you are wrong he said you correct me i i want to make wudu you correct me the man knows who, who is talking to he knows this is this is the grandson of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam he knows that this man wudu will be correct therefore if he is showing me what does it mean he is not stupid let not your islam become a problem for people the islam of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was such that people were drawn to him people were drawn to him to the extent that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to reveal quran to say leave my nabi alone when he invites you surah al ahzab read the ayat when he invites you for a meal go at the time of the meal eat and fantashu go away don't sit there mustasinan mustasina bi hadith don't sit there and talk do not sit there and have conversation go leave him he has a private life he has his wife his children he has to be with them leave him people loved him so much that they collected close to him today may allah forgive us we when we become religious we suddenly discover that i am a muslim and we become obnoxious we have this constant expression of anger on our faces la hawla wa quwwata illa billah believe me if you want to influence people the first thing is people must love you you must be their friend nobody is influenced by an enemy nobody is influenced by somebody who they find disgusting how do you become a friend of somebody by being rude no don't argue with rude people don't waste your time don't acknowledge them we have all this internet conversation somebody write something then you reply then they send something you reply and remember there are these people you can reply till the day of judgment you will not change his opinion you can bring dalail from everywhere in the world his opinion is not going to change don't waste your time khalas let him say boss you are you have your opinion i have my opinion what's the problem you have no problem allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free world believe whatever you like there is a spam folder there is a spam filter for a reason use it right jazakum allah khair end of quarter end of questions assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh